leaders, real life leaders. Hey guys, welcome to today's episode and I'm so excited to have Brian Spear and we are going to be talking about real estate investing for cash flow and legacy wealth and not only that, but passive income because the last thing we need is another headache. So Brian Spear, welcome. Yeah, pleasure to be here, Chantel. Very, very much appreciated. Um, so let's talk about some of the pros. I want to talk about pros and cons. Mm -hmm. So I always like to give people kind of both sides of it, but let's talk about, um, I know that you specialize in, in doing mobile home parks, commercial buildings and parking lots. And I think a lot of people are like, wait, you know, investing in mobile home parks. It's kind of the first thing, right? Isn't it a little bit like, okay, wait a second, what? Um, so, but it's really profitable. So let's start with talking about mobile home parks and how profitable is that? Yeah, no, happy to dive into it. Um, mobile home parks, to your point, that's usually the very first reaction that people get when I say that I invest in mobile home parks. People don't typically brag about owning mobile home parks around the water cooler, right? For decades, the asset class has been overlooked. And for that reason, it's a very niche real estate investment. But over the past handful of years, more and more and more folks have dived into the, the asset class as, as it's really become a darling of private equity. Some of the biggest, biggest players in the world are now investing in mobile home parks. Um, Carlisle Group, um, uh, just a, a litany of additional folks up on Wall Street are now coming into the fray, trying to roll out billion dollar offerings uh, to try to acquire some of these assets that are in short supply. And the reason is that now institutional data is starting to finally be compiled in the asset class where years and years and years previously, there wasn't a lot of data that, that would merit the big institutions coming in and buying them up. But once enough data has been compiled, uh, the, the data speaks for itself. Mobile home parks have outperformed every other asset class over the past several decades and are projected to continue to outperform for the foreseeable future. Uh, Green Street puts out some data which conves uh, conveys that mobile home parks are slated to have the best risk adjusted returns through 2025. So we love the asset class, even if it's just now starting to kind of um, the cats out of the bag, as it were. Uh, for years, it was overlooked, but folks are finally starting to figure it out. Yeah, that's, that's really good. And then the second area you have would be commercial properties and then parking lots, correct? Yeah, we invest in parking lots and parking garages. Again, we like to try to find niche asset classes that really haven't been consolidated by that institutional capital that I referred to earlier. Um, once institutional capital has flooded the market, oftentimes it compresses cap rates and we're, you're not able to buy as, as, as with a margin of safety as much as what we would like. So when we're able to, to find these kind of mom and pop type of assets, usually we can negotiate them in an off market type of environment where there's not a, a, a litany of people on the buy side vying for that asset. And sometimes there's a bid ask discrepancy from what they're asking and what we're willing to pay. And usually if there's that kind of bid ask discrepancy, we feel that we're able to do a pretty good job of negotiating that in an off market transaction where we feel we're buying the asset with a, again, a nice margin of safety and, and parking. We feel like the parking industry is where mobile home parks were about a decade ago. Right now, mobile home parks are just starting to, again, if you follow commercial real estate news and periodicals, it's really been the darling the last handful of years as a lot of players are starting to flood into the space. And we feel like parking is kind of where we're, mobile home parks were maybe a decade ago. Nobody's really doing what we're doing, trying to go out and roll up, uh, you know, parking assets and parking garages, if you will. Um, about 90% of these assets are owned as individual uh, assets by kind of those mom and pop guys. So uh, we, we love the asset class, certainly do. So let's say that somebody maybe has an additional $100,000 and they're like, listen, you know, I've kind of saved up some money. I just don't want the headache of, you know, taking on any risk. Um, and they want to invest a hundred thousand, but they say, okay, I want to kind of come alongside of you. I want you to kind of walk someone through the process and then say, okay, I've got a hundred thousand. Here you go. Like, why would they invest a hundred thousand dollars with someone like Sunrise Capital Investors? Or, you know, I'd like you to name some of your other competitors that maybe are out there. Why would someone invest their hundred thousand dollars with you? 
versus saying, okay, I'm going to put a hundred thousand dollars. I'm going to put it in the stock market with Tesla, Mm -hmm. or I'm going to put the money in Bitcoin or where, you know, wherever they're going to put the money right now. Great, uh, great question. And I would say that it's all about diversification. Um, Whenever you have a compiled a reasonable sized portfolio, um, folks that are getting invested in passive real estate investments such as ours are typically accredited investors uh, defined as somebody who has a net worth of a million dollars or more excluding their primary residence or an earned income of two hundred thousand dollars on an annual basis if filing individually or three hundred thousand dollars on an annual basis if filing jointly nevertheless uh, typically those folks have been able to build a little bit of wealth over time typically in the stock market via those traditional vehicles stocks and bond allocation etc i mean just prior to jumping on the horn here i'm investor relations so i speak to folks all day every day and their different uh, investment journeys um i just had a conversation today with a tv producer who'd been uh you know, Emmy Award winner over the last handful of years, 20, 30 years, and he's got a 95% equity allocation uh, in Wall Street. And that's great. He's been able to build some wealth over time, no doubt about it. He's now in his mid 50s. He's kind of semi retired, if you will. And he's looking to turn that that piles of cash into streams of income so that he could live off of that cash flow. Um, And he's thinking that it's probably a little bit imprudent to have such a large amount of capital on the more aggressive equity allocation at present, when one, it doesn't really give you a substantive amount of cash flow. And secondarily, stocks are typically viewed as a little bit more volatile and ability to make a good chunk of change on the upside, but also a lot of it can evaporate overnight. Um, Obviously, that's uh, kind of been the case decades and decades and decades uh, here, here in the States. Real estate provides what we would consider to be a a favorable risk adjusted return, meaning uh, significantly lower risk when compared to the equity allocation and uh, much more, uh, again, a much more consistent yield than that which you might find in in an equity investment. So it's just a way to diversify your portfolio and from our perspective, smooth out the ride of investing. Um, Folks still should certainly have an allocation to stocks, bonds, et cetera, but we feel the majority of folks have a dearth of um, allocation to real estate. And from our perspective, most prudent investors um, over time do allocate a a reasonable percentage of their wealth to to real estate. So um, when folks are just getting started to your point, um, you know, we're not the only folks on the block. There's now hundreds of folks that are available. When you're just getting started, a couple of things that you should do from my perspective are go to some of these crowdsourced environments, right? You can go vet a litany of sponsors. The number one risk when investing in any respective real estate deal with somebody that you heard on a podcast, right, that you don't know them from Adam, it's to, the number one risk in investing in real estate through a sponsor or a syndicator is, is, the actual individual to whom you're giving capital to go invest. Um, it's always sponsor risk. A, a bad sponsor can take a good deal and run it into the ground. Uh, but a good sponsor can take a, a, a bad deal and at least make it mediocre. They can get you out of there with just maybe a couple of bumps and bruises without you know becoming decapitated, if you will. Um, it's all about the sponsor. And in order to get a little bit of familiarity with that, what I would suggest is folks go to websites like crowdstreet.com and realcrowd.com. These are free free websites where you can sign up completely free and begin vetting all of the different types of investments that are available to passive investors. And you know, by the time that you sift through 5, 10, 15, 20 of these, you'll get to know what the market is like and um, learn what your cup of tea might be in terms of what real estate asset class you might be comfortable with, the type of returns you might be um, seeking and the type of risk you might be willing to take. Um, For example, I mean, development deals are typically a little bit more higher uh, risk with potential higher return compared to more core real estate investments that might not have as much upside, but are certainly more consistent and uh, uh, much more reliable and predictable in terms of their income. So just vetting some of those will, will allow folks to just get some experience before just shipping out 50, 75, 100 grand or more. Um, good idea to do some diligence there. Mm-hmm. 
So, you know, I do agree that in order for you to create legacy wealth, you need to build a portfolio of assets and just kind of hold on to them for a long period of time. But I do agree that you should buy recession resistant Mm -hmm. assets, right? Um, Because obviously it's very volatile out there right now. I mean, it's definitely on the upside right now, but, you know, it's doesn't mean that it's going to stay up for, but for how long, right? So with one of the things that you invest in, um, I think that the mobile home park is really great. I think the commercial real estate is depending on if it's you know, office space or if it's retail office space, I feel like right now is very volatile. And I also think the parking situation um, is very volatile. So if so, I want to talk about two things. One, what is your opinion about what I said? And number two, let's say someone said, okay, I want to invest 100,000, but I don't want to touch commercial real estate right now, because I don't know if you're buying office space, I don't know if you're buying retail. um, And You know, I definitely, for me personally, I think doing parking lots right now, I think is very volatile because I believe that with Tesla, I actually invest in the stock market. I'm not a huge stock market person, but I drive a Tesla. I love a Tesla. And I think Tesla is going to take over. And I think there's going to come a a part where we're not going to even have garages anymore. I think we're going to have self-driving cars and there's not going to be a need for a parking lot. So to me, looking long term and looking at volatility, parking lots is very, very, to me, extremely volatile right now. And number two, commercial real estate, I think, you know, retail, depending on restaurants, that's going to be okay. But I think office space, I mean, I know huge corporations, Geico is a perfect example. We have a huge Geico here. They have said, we are working from home indefinitely. They have not even made any kind of date where they're saying we're going to be, you know, moving back to working from the office anymore. Indefinitely at this point, you guys are working from home. So if more and more companies are doing that work from home, I have a virtual company now where we've gone from seven locations down to one location and we are going across the nation. We went from seven locations locally to now we're in 10 states Mm -hmm. with one corporate office and moving everything virtually. So I know I gave you a lot, but there you go. Bit no, I love every it. bit of it and exceptional stuff. <laughs> and I will say this, kudos to you on kind of getting ahead of the wave, ahead of the curve um, on going virtual. Love every bit of that. A lot of folks have been kind of forced into that over the past year. Nothing wrong with that, but we're in the same vein. Uh, to your point, we used to have a, a reasonable expense line item for our nice office down here in the Tampa Bay area. And it was great, but it, it provided a couple of problems as well. We're restrained in the amount of talent that we can hire because they have to be in the immediate vicinity. Um, And also there's that heavy line item. Now uh, that we've actually opened it up, we've gone fully virtual as well. We did so at the culmination of uh, 2019 and uh, it allowed us to open ourselves up to talent. Now we literally employ people from California to New York to to Florida and a lot of places in between. We actually have full-time international staff on on our team member of our corporate team. So I couldn't agree more. It lowers um, uh, uh, the demand, if you will, for office. And this is why I think when you're vetting given sponsors, um, you you typically, it has been conveyed that it's likely prudent to find sponsors that would consider themselves specialists in maybe one or two different asset classes. It's very difficult to find somebody who's a generalist, who's, a, who's exceptional in all other areas of commercial real estate. Somebody that is 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 going to be buying office and student housing and multifamily and mobile home parks and self storage and all these different types of real estate it's extremely difficult to be become a professional at one just one of those niches must much, much less all of them so we try to go as opposed to extremely wide and an inch deep we try to go exceptionally deep on each respective niche become a master at that but pr- prior to moving on to something else and that's you know that's why we've done mobile home parks for the last decade and it's why we're branching into parking here and growing our parking portfolio. I love the fact that you provided a little bit of insight on parking and your thoughts there. Uh, Great insights. And I I would convey that that is 
I agree with you on, on your statement that it's likely that parking demand will dwindle over time. Um, when you go to the national conferences and parking, um, that is kind of the chatter. That's the chatter. It's what's going to happen. There's likely going to be a decrease in demand o- over the, over time. And uh, the matter, the question is not a matter of if, it is a matter of when. And it is going to occur. Autonomous vehicles will ultimately occur. Uh, but from our perspective, the data conveys that that's not going to occur for a substantive period of time. Uh, the data would convey that based on the number of cars that are already here, already on the uh, road running around, it's going to take roughly 20 to 25 years to have that demand begin to dwindle over time. That provides significant runway from our perspective to acquire parking facilities today that generate a pretty reasonable yield in the near to medium term. And then over time, once that demand does dwindle, you know, 10, 20 years down the road, we will have been able to hold that asset that is in a beautiful location, location, location over a very extended period of time, the underlying land value increases. At that point, the there is likely a higher and better need for that, higher and better use for that land at that point. And usually it's developed into something significantly more valuable than a mere parking lot. That is what we would consider to be icing on the cake. And to your point about you know some of these disruptors, right? Uber and Tesla and the folks coming in and changing the game, what many folks don't know is that the CEO of Uber, the individual that ran this up and ultimately created multi-billion dollar net worth, when he ultimately moved on from Uber, he's now going out and trying to buy as many parking lots as he can because he sees the writing on the wall knowing full well that his company and the likes of Tesla are going to completely change the game. And those parcels of land that are currently parking lots or even parking garages in downtown areas, they no longer are going to be parking lots or potentially parking garages 20, 30 years down the road. And he's trying to buy them up in advance of these transitions occurring. What what the most recent data- Hold on, let me ask you a question about that. Go ahead, go ahead. So there's- Two questions there. Is he buying them up to A, because I guess at some point those cars need to sleep, right? Like, I guess they would, they need to park themselves somewhere. Mm -hmm. So if that is the future, right, where everything is going to be with those kind of self-running cars, Mm -hmm. then at some point, you know, they need to maybe take a break (laughs) and then that would be where they would go. Or is it more that he's saying, okay, like what you just said, well, that's fine. We can buy the parking lot now at this cheap value. The parking lot's still going to be in a good area. Mm -hmm. I'll tear down the parking lot. I've still got good value in that land. And now it can be a condo. So which is it or is it both? I would say it's a combination of both. In the near term, I would say even the the shorter term, it's likely um, where some of those vehicles need to be. Um, to your point, when somebody, even if they have an autonomous vehicle, let's say they commute commute a, a reasonable clip into town, uh, downtown environment. Um, one of two one of two points. Some of the folks feel like that car, if it's an hour long commute from you know suburbs of DFW um, all the way to downtown Dallas. And they get downtown, they, they, they get out of their vehicle at their uh, office building, whatever the case may be, that vehicle might drive an hour back home into their own garage um, and come back later in the day when he's done working. Or it might go to a, an off street parking garage in the immediate vicinity park as you're conveying here, sit there all day, and then it'll come back to him when he's done working. That's one piece. Um, Another piece of the puzzle that you're referencing is it might, the, the, the real estate, let's use a parking garage as an example, might be repurposed. Um, they call it adaptive reuse. The garage, let's say it's a, a five-story par- parking garage, manner than it is today. Today, it might be five stories, all parking lots, all parking spaces. In the future, it might be top floor where it has some sort of um, some greenery uh, where they're actually farming in an urban environment Um, downtown. It's one of the only areas you can get some greenery, if you will. Um, Secondarily, the first floor might become some retail. If the urban core is getting a little bit more dense and cars are no longer needed, that means it could be more walkable. Thinking about European cities, uh, the likes of Venice, um, downtown cities where it's much more walkable. Traditionally, this is a much more favorable type of environment, aka Manhattan. That land is unbelievably expensive and everything is walkable. In addition to that, what Uber really has transitioned into, the former CEO in parking, he's taking some of these spaces and um, with 
the pandemic kind of accelerating this, this transition, um, a lot of folks are now ordering significantly more food offline. Um, if you're ordering, you know, from Grubhub and all these sorts of places, Uber Eats, if you will, the, the demand has skyrocketed for that type of product. So as opposed to all at present, all of that is being done via a normal retail establishment. Let's call it Chipotle. It's a normal retail Chipotle that would be firing out of those online orders. What they're changing is the concept of ghost kitchens, where if they're just doing online orders anyway, they might not to have a, need to have a full retail front. They might make a ghost kitchen on the fifth floor of a parking garage and have those autonomous vehicles come up to the fourth floor, pick up the, the food where it's being made downtown, have that autonomous vehicle go back downtown to the local office building and drop it off. Um, all these things are, um, nobody really knows what's going to happen 20, 30, 40 years down the road. But when you buy something that is in high demand, when you buy parking, you're buying in a parcel of land where somebody is willing to pay you just for the right to stand on that parcel of land. Real estate is all about location, location, location. And you cannot get better parcels than parking lots and parking garages. They're always, if it's paid parking, in downtown core urban environments that have high demand or in very high traffic tourist areas. So we th feel like that underlying land value in 20, 30, 40 years is going to be worth more than it is today. Hey guys, I'm so excited. My new book, One Meal and a Tasting is out now. And if you order the book on Amazon, just the regular paperback edition, if you go in and make a review, you will get the audio book for free. Send a copy of your receipt to questions at chantelrayway.com and you'll get the audio book right away. So let's talk about ghost kitchens for just a second, because I do think that that is going to be the future. I'm so glad that you brought that up, but I want you to kind of expand on where you see that going, because I do think that that is going to be a huge, huge piece of where we're moving to. So expand on that a little bit. You know, it's it's difficult for me to expand too terribly much as um, it's just a, a fairly new concept. Um, but I would convey that users, ultimately in the end, the businesses that win are the businesses that provide the best user experience, not the businesses that have the fattest margins at the outset. Um, it, the businesses that ultimately win in the end are the businesses that make you feel great when you're using their respective product. Amazon, when they were first getting started, had unbelievably razor thin margins, but the owner of that business is now the richest person in the world. And Walmart, who had fatter margins, is losing market share. Um, Blockbuster used to have fatter margins than Netflix, but the user experience for Netflix is significantly better than that of Blockbuster. And now Blockbuster is defunct. You can go on over time on all of the businesses that are disrupting and changing the ways that we use respective products. And would folks prefer to put, push a button on their phone and have whatever type of food that they would like ordered and brought to them on a silver platter, if you will, um, within 20, 30 minutes by virtue of leveraging the technology associated with ghost kitchens and autonomous vehicles? Again, this is fairly far out, but I do think we're trending in that direction. Um, so I would prefer to get out in front of that wave as opposed to be the guy that's holding on to Blockbuster, um, hoping it'll turn around. Um, from my perspective, I'd prefer to get out in front of those trends. Um, it's why we invested in mobile home parks before a lot of folks started rolling them up over the past handful of years. It's why we're investing in parking today. And from our perspective, before other folks kind of see the same opportunity that we see. Yeah, and I've heard that in China, they have like over 7,500 ghost kitchens. In India, they have 3,500. Um, I know the U.S., I think, has about 1,000 different ones. But the ghost kitchens, just if you guys haven't heard of them, they basically only prepare delivery meals. So there's no direct con contact with customers and consumers. So if you think about the size of the kitchen that you need, um, and there's also something called dark kitchens where those are kitchens that prepare meals for delivery and takeout, like 
for on behalf of another restaurant. So that's going on too. I mean, it's it's really wild, but the the bottom line comes out to that ghost kitchens are way cheaper than brick and mortar, you know, where you have traditional these huge kitchens and then you have the eating area and and all of that. So I think that is going to be the next biggest wave of what's going to hit us. Yeah, For time sure. will tell. I mean, as mentioned, I'd like to get out in front of it in advance of some of that occurring. And granted, everybody's crystal ball has, is a little bit foggy and whatnot. Um, but I think that what has occurred in the last year, the pandemic has accelerated that process. Even the folks that are a little bit, what I would consider late adopters to technology are now familiar with Zoom. They're now, you know, we're having this recorded conference call on an application that most folks hadn't heard of a year ago. And now everybody is familiar with Zoom, you know? Uh, so in any event, uh, time will tell, but I, I, I agree, things are, things are changing. I'd rather be out in front of those dem- demographic changes than, than, than behind them. So I think one of the biggest things is right now, people are saying that cash, the value of the dollar is dropping at a massive rate. And so people don't want to keep a lot of cash in the bank because they feel like the dollar is quickly devaluing. And so instead people are saying, you know, real estate is one of those things that there's only so much real estate available. And so that's, and with building prices going up astronomically. So Go back to that question. If if someone says, okay, look, I've got $100,000 sitting in the bank right now. I want to have a good return on it. How does that process work with you? Like, let's say someone like me who says, okay, I get what you're saying about the parking lots. I still am not crazy about investing my money there. But with the mobile home parks, I can get excited about that. Let's just say I say, okay, I want all of my money to go into that. Does Is that how it works? Or do you say, no, when you invest with us, we put a little bit in mobile home, a little bit in commercial, and a little bit in the parking lots? So our, our, I'll tell you how our fund works and then how just in the market, you know, in the marketplace, you can find individuals that will cater to to your taste more often than not. There's a couple of guys that focus specifically on mobile home parks. Our firm, from my from to my knowledge, is the only firm in the country that's buying exclusively mobile home parks and parking lots. When we say mobile home parks, parking lots, and then some commercial, we're we're saying that. Um, I'll give you a perfect example. We're buying a parking garage. It's on Clearwater Beach. Okay, unbelievable land, beautiful parcel Ooh, of land. Top, top one of the top beaches in the world. Right? Beach. Literally 2018 rated the number one beach in the world. And it's a seven story parking garage. First floor has some retail, but we're buying it because of the parking income largely. It's got okay. some commercial real estate there, but it's largely an investment in parking. So we're investing in parking and, and mobile home parks. When somebody invests in our fund, they're investing in the fund structure. And then um, we go out and we find assets that we're, go- we're going to buy underneath that fund structure. And, and each individual asset will be held in a subsidiary LLC, whatever it'll be at the name, LLC1, LLC2, LLC3, all 100% owned underneath that um, umbrella entity. And their capital that is invested in the fund structure will be diversified amongst all those respective investments. Thus far, we have acquired two mobile home parks inside of the fund, one parking lot, have two more mobile home parks under contract, one other parking garage. So it's not a, a it, there's not a, a an explicit definition of exactly how much is going to get allocated to, to which individual uh, sector, but they will definitely be allocated exclusively to those, those sectors. Um, when you're vetting and, and let's say you only want to do invest in mobile home parks, as mentioned, I would go to some of those sites that I'd mentioned, right? Crowd Street, Real Crowd, check them out and see if you could find somebody that's doing exclusively. Uh, exclusively. And I feel like, I feel like, you know, as far as the parking lots, I agree with you. I think I was just kind of playing devil's advocate <laughs> um, just to kind of make it fun. But I do agree with you. I think if the parking lot is in a good enough location, like mm-hmm. you said, you're buying that asset, you can always tear it, tear it as long as you get it in a good enough location, which mm-hmm. most of the time the parking lots are going to be in a great location, just tear it down and build condos or build whatever you need to put there. So I think I'm fine with it. I was just kind of pushing back for fun. No, please do. That's what should be done. I mean, everybody needs to do their due diligence. Uh, To your point about um, 
um, ensuring that assets have the ability to be redeveloped into a higher and better use. I mentioned that we bought one one lot already in Fund Three. It's a it's a lot in downtown Wilmington, North Carolina. Whatever, solid MSA. Long story short, the parking lot itself is um, already zoned for. Uh, mixed use development where we could go up seven stories with something else should we choose to do so at some point in the future. From our perspective, we would prefer to operate it as a parking lot. If I can buy it today and it's generating a pretty darn decent yield and hold that and 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 meet and exceed the metrics that we're laying out here, I would prefer to do just that. But at some point, if somebody comes along and is willing to pay us a um, a gaudy number to redevelop it into a higher and better use, we'd be willing to entertain that at that time. But from our perspective, that's icing on the cake. It's not considered that's not the business model from our perspective. It's we view it as a cash flowing covered land play that provides a again a cash flowing covered land play meaning in the near term the cash flow covers the carrying costs associated with holding that respective asset and the land play suggests that over time the underlying land value is likely to increase uh, so long as you buy in a nice location 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 so Let's talk real quick about the mobile home management part of it. And so one of the things I love about what you're talking about, it is truly passive income. So you don't have to deal with, you know, if, you, if you've got an extra hundred or 200,000, you could put that money into a property, but every time something breaks and this happens and that happens, you have the extra headache. So this mm-hmm. truly is passive income, but who are you hiring to manage these mobile homes? home parks? Is that something you're outsourcing? Is that something you're doing in house? Great stuff. Um, In most real estate asset classes, you have the ability to hire a third party property manager who will handle that respective real estate investment on your behalf. They'll bring in all the rents, they'll pay the expenses, and they'll basically cut you the check at the end of the month. In short, um, in the mobile home park industry, that's not really the case. Um, when we first started vetting this industry a decade ago, we literally called all of the top 100 operators in the space. And we were very good at uh, three things that, that, that you need to have to make a deal happen. You need to find the money, you need to find the deal, and you need to manage the deal. The management side is the hardest part from our perspective. Uh, the other two, we've, we've always been able to do that at a very high clip, and, and it hasn't been an issue from our perspective. The third piece of operating it, 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 it's the difficult aspect in scaling any respective business. And in the mobile home park space, you can't just outsource it to a third party property manager. When we called all the top 100 operators and said, hey, we're very good at these other two parts, would you guys be interested in potentially working with us in kind of a, a joint venture structure or third party property management type of arrangement? Um, of those 100 calls, about five of them were worth really a second follow-up, just a handful. And we ultimately tested three different individual third-party property management companies, all of which failed miserably. We ended up bringing it back in house a couple of years later and ultimately have built a, a vertically integrated property management company that manages all the respective assets across the portfolio. We own in about 13 states on the Eastern half of the country. And that's that's how we operate these respective um, uh, mobile home parks. Um, Again, it's one of the barriers to entry for these massive private equity firms coming down. There's not a lot of folks in the industry that that are willing to even entertain third-party property management. And the reason is because the average lot rent in a mobile home park, it's just a couple hundred bucks. So average lot rent's about 300, 325 across the country. But we've got some stuff that's like $200 for a lot rent. And if you're charging 5% property management fee and you're charging roughly $200 per month, you're making $10 per month as a company to manage that respective unit. And that's just not a lot of of, of revenue, top line revenue, to be able to hire somebody on the ground floor um, that's capable of doing what is necessary to manage the business prudently, and also have something left at the end of the month that would you know, generate a profit from the property management's perspective. From our side, from our perspective, because we own the assets, we're worried about making those assets more value, valuable and, and creating a rate of return from the, from the assets and the real estate investment itself. The property management is a means to an end. Our goal is to make that property management net neutral, where it's not necessarily a profit endeavor, but we also don't want to lose money on it. All we're doing is making it net neutral so that we take the, that's the, the, entity in which we employ the on-site managers, and it takes the risk associated uh, with that investment away from the real estate investment itself. So those those two parties are in different entities, if you will. Um, but that's how we manage the, the portfolio. 
Mm. Yeah, and I, I tell people all the time that, you know, when you, that real wealth, it really grows over time, right? Like, it it's like a process of, okay, if you want to have that wealth, you want to make sure you're buying right, you're investing for the long term. And it's, it's kind of like, I think people can get caught up in buying all of this stuff, like they'll... And I'm a big fan of Bitcoin, so it's not that, but they'll buy it, then they'll sell it, then they'll buy it and sell it. And really, if they can really say, okay, I'm going to take this money, I'm going to set it aside, and I'm just going to kind of, you know, leave it there, right? So it's like, I'm going to put it there, I'm going to leave it there, and then I can don't have to worry about the headache. So let's talk about returns for just a second. So if I put in $100,000 with you, what kind of returns am I looking at realistically? Like Mm -hmm. not pie in the sky, but realistically, what have you seen over the years? Uh, uh, Duly noted. We do our best to try to be conservative on our projections for our partners. In fund three, we're projecting out a 16% annualized rate of return, which takes into account both the annual cash flows that the properties throw off, as well as the net capital events. So when you refinance a property or ultimately sell a property, that 16% annualized takes into account all of the respective cash flows throughout the entirety of the hold period. About half of that 16% comes from the annual cash flow that these properties throw off. And about half of it comes from the equity buildup that is generated over time. So um, again, we try to be mindful about under-promising and over-delivering for our partners. we just rolled out our third growth and in income fund this past quarter. And I'll tell you kind of how fund one and fund two have shaken out over time. We used to do individual deal specific syndications, one-off deals, but as we got bigger and bigger, it made sense to move forward in a more formal fund structure. We started our fund one in the third quarter of 2017 and bought our last asset in fund one in the second quarter of 2018. So it's been going for just about two, uh, just about three years now. And uh, every year we've been fortunate to be able to pay out an annual yield of a little over 8%. In addition to that, we've been able to return the entire principal back to the investors via refinance proceeds. And ultimately we did sell our New York portfolio as well. Rent control was enacted in in 2019 in in New York. So we sold that stuff and sent uh, the proceeds back to our partners. So when somebody invested a hundred grand, they basically received roughly $8,000 per year. So roughly $25,000 in cash flow. And they've also received their original $100,000 investment back from refinance proceeds and ultimately some of the dispositions we've made in that fund along the way. And then from that point, they retain their equity in the fund. And that's a 60-40 split where they will receive 60% of all future proceeds. And Sunrise, we finally begin to partake in the profits and we generate a 40% return on the future profits from here on out. So that's that's how fund one's been doing. Fund two, very similar. We've been fortunate to be able to pay out a little over 8% on an annual basis thus far. We haven't had those liquidity events in fund two just yet, um, uh, as it hasn't been seasoned as long as fund one. But uh, again, same business model. Uh, the goal is to buy, improve, refinance, and hold these assets over the long term. As you'd mentioned, in order to build wealth, real wealth, you have to buy assets and hold onto them over long periods of time. It doesn't matter what you buy, real estate, stocks, Mm -hmm. bonds, whatever. But I I would use Warren Buffett as the example here. Warren Buffett started a business from scratch, a holding company, an investment company, started it from scratch and built it from zero to $600 billion in one lifetime, which is the, 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 the greatest... Uh, build of of uh, of any portfolio um, in in history that we've ever seen, and if you vet his investment philosophy, you will note that he has not once paid dividends on an annual basis to his partners. Um, uh, he also has propensity to buy and hold forever. His favorite hold period is forever. And so is ours. And his reasoning is that when you do that buy and sell that you're referencing with Bitcoin and the litany of other types of investments out there, value add or otherwise, um, that's all well and good. And we've gone full cycle on a lot of deals. But when you sell something, it creates problems for everybody involved. When you sell an asset, you might be able to take a little bit of money off the table and you might be able to generate a reasonable rate of return, a nice IRR, that's great. But it also creates, again, problems. One, tax problems for everybody involved. Um, taxes are everyone's largest expense. And from Warren Buffett's perspective, 
he's got unrealized gains that have just accrued and accrued and accrued and accrued. He's never paid tax on that. He's been holding that for decades. He's never paid tax on it until he sells and it becomes a realized gain. Mm -hmm. And then at that point, he's got a massive tax bill, but he's mm -hmm. been able to build this unbelievable wealth along the way without having, having to pay tax. We are the same way. It's buy, improve, refinance and hold. When you refinance equity out of a deal, you are equity harvesting. You're pulling that equity out. And when you do that, it is a non-taxable event. So for example, we've got a couple of mobile home parks in Maryland that we bought for $2.6 million. And we've been fortunate to be able to improve the, the valuation of those properties. They're now valued at about 6.6 .6 million bucks as per the most recent appraisal. When we go back and we do a cash out refinance on that deal, and we put a $3.6 million loan on that asset, we're able to pull all that capital back out, return it all to investors in a non-taxable event, retain the equity in the deal and partake on that cash flow on an ongoing basis. That's how you really build wealth over the long term. The goal from our perspective is to generate cash flow and build legacy wealth for as many people as we possibly can along the way. And we feel that buy and prove and hold model is the best way to do it. Um, you know, when folks are 60, 70, 80 years old and they've been holding these assets for, for decades, they've been in the game. What most folks would convey when you ask them, what is your biggest regret in your investment portfolio to a real estate guy that's been doing this 50 years? He'll always say, most times they'll say, hey, I wish I wouldn't have sold that property or whatever that property was. Because when he sold it, it was a great hit. You know, he made a good amount of money, but he looks back now and it's worth five, six, 10 X what it was when he sold it. Um, so we want to help folks build wealth over the long term. That's I love that. Philosophy. And I love one of uh, Warren Buffett's, my favorite quote he has is rule number one, never lose money. Rule number two, don't forget rule number one, right? <laughs> like yes, it's like yes. the best quote ever. And yes. it's true. I love that. And just buying and holding instead of this whole idea of that, hey, I'm just going to buy it. I'm going to hold it. And it, it actually has a lot less stress because yeah. this whole idea of like, you know, these people are like, I'm going to buy it, then I'm going to sell it, then I'm going to buy it, then I'm going to sell it, then I'm going to watching it every second and that kind of strategy. If you can, if you can get to the place where you can go, I'm just going to buy it, I'm going to hold it. And that, that creates the most amount of peace that you can have. Yeah, I, I share the sentiment. Um, it, it's, it's trying to generate the best risk adjusted returns possible and also trying to create passive income that affords folks the opportunity to to enjoy the lifestyle that that they would like with their their friends and family along the way. So it's it's uh, it's from my perspective, um, a very good way for folks in one generation to be able to change their family tree while we've been able to do pretty well over the past handful of years in this industry. And we now own mobile home parks in the a lot of different states across the eastern half of the country. My first experience with mobile home parks was living in one when I was 10 years old. My parents got divorced, didn't grow up you know, with very much, if you will. My dad moved to Gary, Indiana. My mom moved to uh, uh, south side of Chicago into a mobile home park. And that was my first experience with, with the industry as it were. Every month, our big, biggest expense would be me walking across the mobile home park and handing the lot rent to the manager, to the landlord. And it was, how can I get out of this situation and how can I be on the other side of that respective table? So um, in just one generation, you truly can uh, do quite well uh, by just employing some of these strategies over, and, and just uh, being being prudent with that capital. It wouldn't uh, uh, happen overnight, but just consistently and persistently putting one foot in front of the other. Uh, you can do some really phenomenal things in just one, one generation. Love that. Well, tell listeners where they can find you and where they can follow you. Uh, a couple places. One, I would say that if folks want to learn just more about commercial real estate in general, why they might want to diversify into commercial real estate, and then ultimately passively investing in mobile home parks, we put together a pretty dense 50 page report for folks to get an idea of what that looks like. And if they are interested in uh, uh, passively investing in mobile home parks, they can check it out by going to sunrisecapitalinvestors.com slash free report. Again, sunrisecapitalinvestors.com slash free report. Go sift through it, provide some data on why some semblance of an allocation to real estate can smooth out overall rates of return, ease the burden um, uh, in your investment journey, and then digs a little bit deeper into why we love mobile home parks. So we'll leave it at that, Chantel, and uh, right. it's much appreciated. Well, you guys stay tuned. We have another episode coming up in just a few. Bye-bye for now. Thanks for listening to this episode of Real Life Leadership. 
If you'd like to get the show notes or access more resources, log on to reallifeleaders.com slash podcast to get the show notes from this episode and any other resources we might have mentioned. And also, we'd love to hear from you. Be sure to review or rate this podcast on Apple Podcasts to help spread the word. And if you have any leadership questions you want answered, email podcast at reallifeleaders.com. 